Hi, my name is Alex Conway and I'm at VMware Research. And this is the OSDI and ATC preview talk on key value stores and databases. So let's start at the beginning. What is a key value store and what is a database? Both key value stores and databases are a means to ingest or otherwise store data in order to answer queries on it later. What differentiates key value stores from databases is that key value stores are somewhat simpler. They tend to have a single index, they can only store key value pairs, and they often have weaker guarantees as to things like durability and isolation. Databases, on the other hand, often span multiple indices, and the data can be quite structured. They also may support high-level query languages in order to ask more complex queries. This talk is going to focus on two core aspects of key value store and database design. And these are spatial locality and concurrency. All the papers, all the key value store and database papers at OSDI and ATC touch on one of these two topics. In this talk, I'm going to take a data structural approach to these core design aspects because that is my general approach as a systems researcher. This means that at times I'm going to abstract away some important systems uh, concepts in order to make data structural points. I'm going to introduce three data structures that commonly are used to implement key value stores and databases and see how their design is influenced by and affects spatial locality and concurrency. And sort of the key data structural question that I'm going to be asking and trying to answer is when should we move data? So let's start with spatial locality. Spatial locality refers to the relationship between several types of locality. The first is write locality, which is the relationship between items as they are inserted or updated. Similarly, there's read locality, which is the relationship between items when they are, uh, as they are queried either using point queries or range queries. Both read locality and write locality are, are types of logical locality, and they are part of the workload and something that the key value store database doesn't have any control over. What the key value store database can control is the physical locality, which is generally dictated by the data structure that's used to implement the system. So the physical locality will look very different if the system uses a tree versus an LSM versus a hash table. When physical locality reflects the write locality well, this leads to good write performance. And when physical locality reflects the read locality well, this leads to good read performance. However, in general, it's possible that the read and write locality can be completely incompatible. And this can lead to a trade-off between read performance and write performance as the physical locality cannot reflect both the read locality and write locality perfectly. So you might be asking, well, how much does locality really affect performance? Well, this comes down to the data granularity. So here in this slide, I have these two large rectangles, which represent IO sized blocks. This is the amount of data that's required to efficiently perform an IO. So fine grained data is data where many data items will fit into one of these IO blocks. And then if we try and access a single one of these data items, but don't ac access the other items in, in its block, this is going to be inefficient almost by definition. So with fine grained data, what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to batch related items together in these blocks. And here when I say related items, I mean items that are going to be accessed together, either by reads or by writes. With coarse grained data, on the other hand, relatively few data items will fit into a single IO block, or perhaps even the data items are larger than IO blocks. In this case, access to a single item is already going to use much of the IO required to fetch the block. And so there's less of a performance hit from, from, doing, uh, from accessing just one item in a block. This means that we have more flexibility, and in general, any sort of overheads that are required in order to batch items together might not be worth it when the data is coarse grained. So let's get back to our original data structural question of when we should move data because of locality. Well, what this suggests is that fine-grained data is going to lead us to want to move data if it'll improve locality. And it's worth, generally worth the cost of doing so. An example of a data structure which does this is the log structured merge tree, or LSM. However, with coarse-grained data, we should generally avoid moving data in order to improve, improve locality because the cost of, of having poor locality is, is, uh, is less. An example of a data structure that does this is the unclustered index. So let's look a little bit at the log structured merge tree, or LSM. An LSM is a data structure that has several levels. 
Items in each level are kept in sorted order and divided into SS tables, where each SS table is generally larger than the IO, the efficient IO uh, block size. The SS table on level zero is special and is called the mem table. When inserts and updates come in, they are initially applied to the mem table, which is kept in main memory. Periodically, SS tables can be compacted together into overlapping SS tables on the next level. What this means is all the data items in those SS tables are merged together, so the resulting output is in sorted order, and then is then just divided up into SS tables. The way queries are answered is by looking at all SS tables in the data structure that have a key range overlapping with the uh, keys of the query. So for a given point query, for example, perhaps we would look in these yellow SS tables here. So the point of compaction is to reduce the number of SS tables required to answer queries. So for example, after we perform this compaction here, we will have taken two SS tables which overlap with its given point query, and the output will only have one. So what compactions do in LSMs really is they improve the locality of the system. They do so by moving and reorganizing data. However, there's a cost to doing this. All these SS tables must be read and then the outputting, output SS tables have to be written to the storage medium. So this can lead to additional writing. And generally we refer to this as write amplification. This is the amount of physical writing we do to the storage medium relative to the logical amount of data that is being inserted or updated as part of the workload. So we see that log structure merge trees move data in order to improve locality. And so this is a kind of data structure that is generally good to use with fine grained data. So now let's look at the unclustered index. In an unclustered index, data is stored in a log. So when new updates and inserts come in, they're just appended to the end of the log. Additionally, the keys are stored in an index. In order to answer a query, the query looks into the index and the index will return a reference to the log. Then the value that's needed to, return, to answer the query is fetched from that part of the log. So note that when we, if we perform a range query, for example, we may not have any read locality in the log. When we look in the index, the references that we're given are gonna be the locations in the log where these items reside. And this is gonna depend entirely on when they were written, uh, entirely on when they were written, not on what their key values are or anything like that. So note here that if we are using fine-grained data, that all of these accesses can be almost completely random. And so this can be very inefficient. However, if we have coarse-grained data, this isn't such a big deal. An additional benefit of coarse-grained data is that there will be relatively fewer keys. And so in this case, the index will be small and ideally it will fit in memory. When the index fits in memory, all the writing that we're doing is just in appending items to the end of the log. So we don't move any data and as a result, we don't get read locality, but we do very little writing and we can have very low write amplification. In the case where the index fits, fits in memory, we can even have write amplification that looks like one, which is sort of the best that you can do. I should note though, that if the workload contains things like deletes or updates, this can create holes in the log. And eventually this is sort of gonna age the system and require garbage collection in order to avoid using uh, too much space. So this can result eventually in some additional write amplification, even when the index does fit in memory. So that's the unclustered index, which is an example of a data structure that avoids moving data and is thus a, a good choice of, of a data structure to use with coarse grain data. So that brings me to my second topic, concurrency. One of the main challenges with concurrency is how do you coordinate access to shared data? So in this case, a key value store or database has some shared data, which multiple clients are trying to access. When they are trying to access the same data item, and at least one of them is trying to perform a write, we need to coordinate that access in order to uh, maintain consistency and determine the order of operations. However, if multiple clients are accessing disjoint data, or if they're access accessing the same data item, but they're performing reads, we'd like the, these clients to be able to do so in parallel because that improves concurrent performance. So coming back to the data structural question I've been asking, when should we move data? From the perspective of concurrency, we generally don't wanna move data 
because moving data complicates locking and can often contribute to reduced concurrency. So how, what can we do to uh, mitigate or avoid moving data? I'm gonna look at two examples here. The first is in the LSM. Now, remember that in an LSM, moving data is a fundamental part of the operation of the data structure. But we're gonna see that we can at least in part mitigate uh, the, the overhead of moving data by amortizing locking. I'm also gonna introduce the Cuckoo hash table, which is a popular hash table implementation that involves a, a fair degree of data movement. However, we're gonna see that a seemingly small change to the Cuckoo hash table allows us to reduce data movement without sacrificing performance and obtain substantially better concurrency than with the Cuckoo hash table. Okay, so let's look at the LSM. So when we're thinking about how to uh, coordinate data access, what we're really interested in is where writes are performed because writes are, are the types of data accesses that we need to coordinate. So in the LSM, these happen in two places. The first is in the mem table where inserts and updates are applied. And the second is during compaction. And there's sort of gonna be some good news here and some bad news here. If we start with the bad news, the mem table is an unavoidable point of contention. All operations have to access the mem table. And the only sort of saving grace here is that it's an in-memory data structure and we can kind of rely on in-memory uh, concurrent data structures that use fine grade locking, sharding, or lock-free data structures, for example, in order to sort of mitigate this. What's interesting though, is what happens with compaction. So recall the compaction is a large asynchronous operation that amortizes IOs by batching many uh, writes together. But this has the nice effect of also amortizing the locking. Why? Well, as this asynchronous operation completes, the uh, new SS tables are swapped in using essentially uh, metadata operations, almost like a pointer swap. And so we perform a huge amount of writes and changes in a very short period of time. And that means that we only need to hold locks and restrict access to SS tables for that short period of time. And so in addition to IO, we can also amortize this sort of locking overhead. So now let's look at the Cuckoo hash table. The Cuckoo hash table is a popular hash table implementation. It works by dividing up all the slots of the hash table into a collection of buckets that usually have four or maybe eight items each. To insert an item, you hash its key to get two buckets and you place the item in one of those two buckets, usually the one that contains fewer items. To perform a query, you do a similar thing. You hash the key of the query to get the two buckets and you check if the item is in one of the two buckets and this lets you answer the query. A wrinkle that can happen is what happens when you're trying to insert an item and both buckets are full. What you do in a cuckoo hash table is you kick an item to its other bucket. And what this means is you select an item in one of the two buckets, you look at its other bucket, and if there's room in that bucket, you move it to its other bucket, creating a slot for you to insert the item in one of its two canonical buckets. The reason that cuckoo hash tables kick items is for space efficiency. If you don't kick items, then fundamental balls and bins theorems uh, tell you that you will uh, find an item, you will try and perform an insert that will find two full buckets uh, when you've used relatively little of your total space um, with very high probability. So this lets Cuckoo hash tables use usually 90 or 95% of their space despite this sort of uh, combinatorial problem. So can we make a Cuckoo hash table concurrent? Well, let's just try and do the most straightforward thing, which is we just lock the buckets as we need to, uh, as we uh, as we try and insert into them or, or query them. So here, when we perform an insert, we're going to lock these two buckets here uh, in yellow. However, what happens when we need to kick? Well, here, in order to move this item to its uh, other bucket to make room to perform this insert, we're going to have to lock that other bucket as well. And you know this process can sort of involve locking an arbitrary chain of buckets. And this creates two key difficulties. When we start the insert, we don't know which buckets we're gonna to write to. And we also need to lock the buckets in a canonical order. Because if we just try and lock the buckets as we access them, another thread can come and try and lock the buckets in the opposite order. And that will create a deadlock. So 
Here we see that moving data in the Cuckoo hash table creates a challenge to concurrency. And what state-of-the-art concurrent Cuckoo hash tables do is they perform a read-only version of the insert, see which buckets need to be locked, try and lock those buckets in a canonical order, and then they try and perform the insert, assuming that uh, nothing has changed during the locking process. So a variation on the Cuckoo hash table that solves this problem is the power of two choice hash table. The algorithm for the power of two choice hash table is essentially the same as the Cuckoo hash table, except without kicking. So to insert an item, you hash a key into two buckets and you place the item in the bucket as fewer items. What makes this work is that we use larger buckets. Recall the reason we had to kick in a Cuckoo hash table is because it, otherwise we wouldn't use our space efficiently. When we use larger buckets, there's a powerful theorem by Berenbrink et al. that says with large enough buckets, we can use almost all of the space before a bucket fills with very high probability. And here large enough means in general about 64 slots per bucket. Um, and this is for you know reasonable sizes of hash tables. Um, so now in order to make this uh, power of two choice hash table concurrent, we can just do the thing we wanna do, which is we can just lock the buckets that we're going to insert into. Now note that I'm sort of glossing over a, a uh, engineering issue that's been created here, which is how do you efficiently insert or query a large bucket? This bucket may span multiple cache lines. Well, this can be solved by using metadata and wide instructions in order to filter the places that one needs to look. Um, and so this problem is, is solvable. And so let's just look for a second at the power two choice uh, hash table versus the cuckoo hash table uh, on insertion performance and see how they scale. So here, uh, what I've run is a benchmark that performs uh, 60, uh, 67 million insertions into a cuckoo hash table and a power two choice hash table with between one and eight threads. The y-axis here is throughput in millions per second, so higher is better. And what I wanna note here is that the power two choice hash table scales substantially better than the cuckoo hash table, 7.3 times uh, the throughput with eight threads as opposed to 5.1 with the cuckoo hash table. If we look at what happens with Positive queries, on the other hand, we don't see as much of a scaling gap. Um, and that's because queries with cuckoo hash tables don't have to, uh, don't have to look in more than just the two, uh, two buckets, two canonical buckets. So as you can see, uh, by reducing data movement in the cuckoo hash table, by using the power of two choice hash table, we can obtain better concurrency uh, by simplifying the locking procedure. Thank you very much for uh, coming to this preview talk. Uh, my name again, again is Alex Conway at VMware Research. This is my email if you have any questions. Uh, I really hope you enjoy the rest of the sessions and uh, enjoy OSDI and ATC. Thanks.